Welcome to the lecture on sales promotions. Sales promotions are one of the promotional elements that we talk about in IMC, or Integrated Marketing Communications. So in other lectures, I talk about direct marketing, personal selling, and PR and sponsorship. This one, I'm going to focus on sales promotions, which is a very common promotional element that many consumers see and experience on a day-to-day -day basis. The first example I have here is one that's uh, made by a casino company. So imagine you're checking your mail and you see this wallet shaped thing in your letterbox. Uh, of course, you're going to engage with it, take it out, open it and have a look. Um, so that aspect of the sales promotion is very similar to direct marketing. And I mentioned in my direct marketing lecture how the two promotional elements of direct marketing and sales promotions work really well together. They integrate really well together. The direct marketing gets the inf information or the advertising material to the audience, um, but then the sales promotion has another level of um, value added incentive. And I'll explain that in some subsequent slides. But to go back to this example, so you go to your letterbox, you see this thing that looks like a wallet. Of course, you're going to engage with it because, you know, what is a wallet doing in your letterbox? You open it up and then you see a hundred dollar bill in there. Um, this is, of course, going to encourage you to get it out, have a closer look. And so now you're really engaged with this advertising material. And you'll notice if you read the dollar bill that it says we'd like to offer you a hundred free dollars to give our casino a try. Right, so remember this advertising material or this promotional element is from the local casino. They've obviously got a database or have sent out um, these direct mailers, these sales promotions to households that they believe are within their target market. So they're trying to target prospects rather than suspects using that direct marketing terminology. Um, but the sales promotion is this added incentive that then encourages the audience or the consumers to you know, actually do something. And in this case, if you've got a hundred free dollars to try out a casino, well, why wouldn't you go and try it out? So this is one example of how sales promotions give that little nudge in the right direction for a consumer to do what the company wants them to do. I'll have some other examples that perhaps are less nefarious. So casinos here, probably not the best example to use if we want to think about corporate social responsibility, because you're essentially encouraging people to gamble. But you know, marketing is neither good nor evil, it's amoral and it's a tool that companies, both good and bad, both profit and non-profit, can use uh, in whatever way they can use legally in order to enhance the value that they propose to be offering to their consumers. So the learning objectives for this lecture is spread across several lectures. Um, but today we're only going to focus on this first one. So understanding how sales promotions work. So that's really looking at the psychology behind why sales promotions work and therefore why they are so popular. Similar to direct marketing, sales promotions are a promotional element that are becoming increasingly more commonly used by businesses. And you'll notice every time you go into a supermarket, you'll see sales promotions. Uh, you'll see sales promotions sent to you via direct mailer or sometimes even as junk mail. And you'll see sales promotions and hear about them on TV and radio respectively. So we're gonna understand how they work and that will probably explain why they're so popular. Then in subsequent lectures, we'll look at how sales promotions can be directed at more than just the end consumer. So your experience of sales promotions has probably been as a consumer. Uh, those examples I mentioned before, going to the supermarket, seeing something for sale or receiving something in the mail that gives you a coupon or a voucher or discount of some form. Um, but sales promotions works from business to business as well, and they can also work uh, by targeting sales people. Um, so we'll look at those in subsequent lectures. Uh, we'll look at the different types of sales promotions because of the different types of audiences you can target with them. Um, and then, uh, quite importantly, at the end, we're going to look at the disadvantages of sales promotions. So as good as they are for the business in terms of um, nudging consumers in the right direction and getting that immediate return on investment, um, and maybe also creating a habit that will lead to long-term sales. As good as sales promotions are for doing that, there are some serious downsides that we will have to look at and consider. 
So, sales promotions, and I'll use the acronym SP just for uh, brevity, are any extra incentive used by manufacturers or other businesses to induce consumers or sometimes trade to buy a brand and to encourage the sales force to aggressively sell it. So, if you remember, I said how sales promotions can be targeted at different um, stakeholders. So consumers are one, other businesses or trade is another, and obviously sales force or the sales people that uh, are responsible for pushing your product. They are another stakeholder that sales promotions can be aimed at. So even though there are different audiences, the fundamental psychology behind it is that it's an extra incentive. So that's really important to rem remember that sales promotions are an extra in incentive above and beyond the product or service that you're already uh, buying. Right, so if you're buying a box of cereal for breakfast, there are certain, I guess, benefits to buying that cereal. It could be that it's convenient, it might have the right nutritional balance, uh, you might like the taste. So these are, you know, actual product attributes that you are buying the product for. Now, a sales promotion is an extra incentive to make the consumer want to buy that product, above and beyond the typical product attributes of nutrition, convenience, taste, etc. Right. Um, and those extra incentives encourage the consumers to go, oh, hang on a second, I've got this cereal over here, which I kind of like, and there's this other cereal here, which I also kind of like. Well, this one here is giving me an extra incentive. Maybe it's an extra 25%, or maybe it's a toy that comes with it, or maybe a sticker album, or I enter a competition of some sort, win a trip somewhere. Well, okay, I'm going to buy this, all things held equal. right? So that's how sales promotion work psychologically, an extra incentive. Retailers use promotional incentives to influence shopper behavior. So this is a classic example of a point of purchase or point of sale uh, sales promotion. You're going in thinking you're buying one uh, brand of cereal and then this extra incentive nudges you over to the other direction. Um, and organizations sometimes use them to enhance and maintain relationships with their businesses that they work with. So the sales promotion I just mentioned before about the cereal, this is something that the manufacturer has obviously invested in, right? Because it costs the manufacturer of the cereal to, you know, launch a sales promotion, perhaps involving a competition that's related to their cereal. Um, now you're thinking, well, how does that enhance the relationship with the retailer? Well, the retailer is not going to complain if the manufacturer chooses, chooses to invest additional marketing into their product because the retailer will then have more confidence that the cereal will sell better. It'll turn over faster and therefore it'll increase the amount of merchandise the retailer is able to sell to consumers. So the thing with retailers is they don't really care too much which brands sell. They want the brands that give them the highest profit margin to sell as quickly and as often as possible. So as a manufacturer vying for that retail shelf space, you want to give them incentives that will encourage them to give your product either the best position on the shelf or even just to keep your product on the shelf because they have limited real estate and any number of products and brands are always trying to be on the retail shelf because that is the bottleneck where all the consumers go in order to buy all the thousands of different products that are available. Right, so the relationship with the retailer is very important. And if you're on a fast moving consumer good, such as cereal, or in this other example, such as makeup, then you might want to encourage the retailer to keep you on board uh, because their shelf space is limited. And so competition is tough there for the manufacturer. So any extra incentive that you can give the consumer to buy a product will also be an extra incentive to keep you on the retail shelf. So the other example I have here on the slide is Sephora, which is a cosmetics company, obviously. And this is just a really um, quick example of how, how sales promotion works in a digital environment, right? So this is an online um, shopping website, I suppose, that Sephora is using, uh, up to 30% off. So this is the extra incentive that the consumer is being given to buy this Sephora product. Right. And so these sales promotions are so common uh, that you probably don't even remember specifically when you have seen them. But I want you to spend the next week paying attention to all the sales promotions, all the extra incentives that you're given, whether you are browsing online or walking through a shopping mall or in a supermarket or sitting on a bus. Have a look around to see what extra incentives businesses are offering you to encourage you to buy their product. 
And these extra incentives are those that are that go beyond, above and beyond the product or service that you would normally be buying anyway. So sales promotions can do a lot of great things. They can stimulate the sales force, right? Uh, get the actual sales reps excited about pushing a product. It can invigorate a mature brand. So if you think about a mature sector with brands that are kind of dull and have been there for a long time, they're, you know, they've been improved and improved and improved. There's not much more you can really do with that product. Well, in those sorts of mature markets, sales promotions really inject a little bit of extra energy uh, into the sector and really get things moving and people excited about that, at the, about the product or the brand. Um, you can use sales promotions to convert competitors over to your product. So I mentioned before how it's an extra incentive to nudge people to buy your product, but this extra incentive can also nudge people away from their regular brand over to your product as well, right? Or you can use it to keep people onto your brand uh, because you know that the competition is going to be trying the same thing. So there's a sales promotion war in essence, everyone giving people these extra incentives to try and pull them over to their side. Uh, you can use sales promotions to facilitate the introduction of new products. So new products are risky, both for retailers and for consumers. Uh, people typically, you know, like to be lazy and shop in a habitual fashion. And so if they are normally buying a brand of milk or a brand of yogurt or a brand of cereal, um, there's not much that really brings them out of that habit onto a new product, unless a sales promotion, this extra incentive can attract them that way. And that's why we see them used so commonly. If you think about your favorite brand of yogurt or your favorite brand of milk, normally it's just a habit. You know, you go to the supermarket, you grab it off the shelf, you put it in your trolley. But every now and then something will say, you know, discount, or sale or super saver or something like that. And that is bound to get your attention, this extra incentive, and that might uh, bring you over. So if you imagine you're introducing a new product with no sort of you know brand loyalty existing in the first place, it's very difficult to convince people to buy you. So a sales promotion might encourage people to give you a go. Um, you can use sales promotions to increase merchandising space. So we mentioned before how at the retail level, shelf space is very limited. And so, you know, if everything is full, which it often is, how do you get more products into that space? Well, often sales promotions take up a physical form that is um, that goes beyond the normal shelf space. So I'll talk about sampling as a form of sales promotion later on. And if we think about sampling, once again, in the retail environment, it's not too uncommon these days to see someone set up a stall where they have some of these products and they're giving out free samples. Okay, so samples are a type of sales promotion, right? It's an extra incentive for people to try the product because they're getting a free sample now. And so you can see how that would work really well if you're introducing a new product or even if it's an existing product and you wanna just get people a little bit more excited about your brand and get them to know about your brand. And also in this case, it's increasing that merchandising space because often where they're, they're doing the sampling, the sales promotion, they'll also have products which they can hand over to the customer. Right. Uh, or a voucher, which then directs them somewhere. But anyway, there is more merchandising activity happening there in the space that was otherwise not really used for anything by the retailer beforehand. You can use sales promotions to neutralize competitive ads. So this is an interesting case where you're balancing uh, where you're combating advertising, traditional advertising with a, a promotional element such as sales promotions. So I want you to imagine this. You've got let's say you're a new brand of cola, right? Some sort of organic. Uh, you know, free tr uh, trade um, aid type of cola and you're all, you know, green and very boutique and very niche and you're competing with the likes of Coca-Cola, which everyone knows, uh, and Pepsi that everyone knows. So they're advertising, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of marketing, uh, glitz and glamour, and they've got celebrity endorsements and all this. Now you can't compete with that because they are going to be everywhere. And as a small company, you can't compete from a traditional advertising point of view. But all these ads that the cola companies do are going to bring people to hopefully a bottleneck such as a supermarket or your local dairy or some other sort of store where people have to physically go to buy the product, right? So when that happens, if 
you didn't do any advertising because you can't afford it, people are still going to have to go somewhere to buy their cola. Now, if your cola is being sold at the same place as these other brands that are also advertising, then you can do what is a guerrilla marketing sort of tactic and intercept, right? You can do some intercepting uh, promotional work at that bottleneck where people go to the store because they've heard about Coke and they've heard about Pepsi and they feel they're in the mood to buy uh, a soda because it's hot and they've seen all these ads showing how refreshing it is. At that point of purchase, if you have a sales promotion that says something like, you know, two for one or enter a competition if you uh, buy our brand, then that might be that extra nudge, that extra incentive that gets people to pick your product. And so you've neutralized competitors' advertising power, right? They've spent millions of dollars getting people to the supermarket. You spend a fraction of that amount at the point of purchase to convert them over to your cola by offering some form of sales promotion, whether it be a discount, a cool competition, maybe some sampling at the point of purchase. Um, so that's a really, really interesting way of thinking of how sales promotions as a promotional element can neutralize some competitive ads, particularly if you're competing with people, uh, with businesses that have such a huge marketing budget that you can't possibly go one, one to one uh, with them in terms of advertising uh, reach and frequency. So obtain trial purchases. So we mentioned about uh, sampling as a sales promotion and that will get people to try your product. Uh, I also mentioned before how you can use sales promotions to hold the current users of your products. Uh, you can help increase product usage. So the thing about um, product uses, the more you have, the more you use. And so when you have a sales promotion, there might be you know, a bundle pack. So buy one, get another one at half price or buy one, there's 25% more. So these extra incentives that encourage people to buy a product, um, not only help close the sale, but they also help encourage people to use more of the product because you've given them more of the product, right? So if they have 25% more toilet paper, for example, or 25% more mustard, um, they typically will just use more of the product because there's more there to be used. And so you're increasing product usage, developing a habit that they can use more of your product on a day-to-day -day basis, and therefore you're increasing the size of your pie uh, or the, the depth of the pie in terms of the amount of product that uh, cus customers have become accustomed to using uh, because the sales promotions have provided them with extra product. Uh, you can use sales promotions to preempt competition. So if you know something's happening or if it's a seasonal product and you know that your competitors are going to do something soon, then you can launch a sales promotion um, in order to secure your custom base or to get them to buy your product. Or if you combine it with the above example of increasing product usage, you launch a sales competition, um, but you also give them a bit of extra product. You give the consumers uh, more, more product in your sales promotion and that holds them right with you because they have more of your product and not going to be in the market to buy the other competing brands for a longer period of time. Right? So, just as an example, let's say you um, are working for a soup company and you know that people buy soup in winter. And so you know coming around to winter, there might be a lot of competitor activity from, your, from other businesses. So what you do is you launch a sales promotion just before that winter season starts, um, encouraging people to buy extra amounts of your soup. Right? So you might have a two for one offer or 25% uh, more, whatever it might be, you're encouraging them to buy your product because you're giving them this extra incentive, an extra product, um, but you're doing it slightly before the competitors have a chance to, uh, for the advertising to work or be launched or for them to even launch their own sales promotion. And because people have bought your product first and you've given them a little bit more, they're going to be using your product for longer. And that neutralizes the competition who might have uh, had this big idea, this big competition, or maybe a huge uh, advertising campaign about to launch, right? And so you can use sales promotions to preempt competition. And finally, sales promotions can be used to reinforce advertising. So remember, this is an IMC paper, so integrated marketing communications. This means that anything you do should theoretically be integrated with other things that you're doing. And sales promotions is a great example of something that can be used not just instead of advertising, which is some of the examples I made have given the impression of how sales promotions work, but sales promotions obviously work with advertising as well. So advertising, you know, will build the brand image over, you know, many many 
months or even years uh, and sales promotions add the extra value for people to want to engage with your product or brand or service and so the two things should go hand in hand and sales promotion should definitely not degrade or dilute the brand equity that has been built up over years of advertising but in subsequent lectures we'll see sometimes that's not the case and this obsession on return on investment and short-term revenue uh, sometimes comes at the expense of long-term brand building and sales promotion is probably the sales um, the promotional element that is most guilty of, of degrading brand equity but used properly it should reinforce advertising and by that we mean that you know when you see a sales promotion for a brand it should be obviously linked to that brand and very synergistic and in line with the previous advertising that is um, talking about that brand so what can't sales promotions do well they can do a lot of cool things in the previous slide that we've talked about um, but what they can't do is compensate for a lack of training uh, or advertising within your staff or within your sales rep so if a sales rep has not been taught to sell your product properly uh, so we're looking at the more high involvement products now uh, like vacuum cleaners good example or, or in the case of the slide you know suits now if a sales rep can't sell your particular product or your brand of suit or vacuum cleaner because they haven't been trained properly to demonstrate your product then a cool sales promotion like 25 percent discount or uh, enter you know buy this product to enter this competition that's not going to help because it's basically the transaction has been botched up from the personal selling perspective right similarly if there's a lack of advertising and brand building and no one knows about your brand sales promotions might get them to try your product but it certainly uh, is not viable long term you can't constantly be discounting your product right because then you're cutting into your profit margin uh, and so you need that advertising to build a long-term brand image and that brand loyalty and give people a reason to buy your brand uh, that is more than just the extra incentive that you, you, you're throwing at them Right. Sales promotions can't give a long-term reason to, for a repeat purchase of the brand. So this is very similar to the previous example I talked about, about how sales promotions cannot compensate for a lack of advertising. Similarly, if there's no real reason, if your product benefits aren't that good and the only way you can get people to buy a product is by constantly discounting or giving them free stuff, then that is obviously not a sustainable competitive advantage, right? So you need to fix the product or fix the service or train the people that sell your products better. Uh, sales promotions are short term. They get that extra incentive for people to buy your product, but the long term viability, it's debatable how successful sales promotions are uh, for giving people a long term reason to buy your product. And finally, it can't stop an established brand's declining sales or basic non acceptance. So, you know. If you think of a product that is just uh, it's it's gone past that mature life cycle, it's on the way out. Um, cigarettes is a good example, even though there's a lot of regulation in place, and you probably you well you can't uh, have sales promotions related to cigarettes. But for argument's sake, let's say you could. Um, it's still not going to combat the decline of that product use because there's just so much going against it. There's so much government regulation trying to you know make. Um, countries smoke free uh, in the next two decades uh, there's also a lot of um, other legislation stopping you from advertising and so you know we see the sort of degrading brand loyalty towards products such as cigarettes and obviously there's a societal um, there's a lack of social license in those products to operate and so therefore this basic non-acceptance of certain products uh, will just mean that you know they're on the way out and it doesn't match it doesn't matter how much extra incentive you give people in the form of sales promotions to try and buy these products is just not going to work. So the product needs to be changed completely or divested and the uh, money invested in something else, which is why, you know, tobacco is a good example of how they're divesting in cigarettes and investing in vaping. So vaping, because the legislation is still new, can have, you know, promotions and sales promotions and, you know, buy one and get one at half price, try this flavor or get that one uh, free. All these different things can occur. Now, the legislation is catching up to this pro uh, to, to vaping products. Um, however, in the meanwhile, you can see how, you know, a product that has a little bit more societal acceptance uh, works really well when it's combined with sales promotion. On the other hand, a product that doesn't have societal acceptance, doesn't have the right sales rep training, maybe doesn't have the right advertising, doesn't really give people that long-term reason to buy the brand anymore, 
that really doesn't work that well with sales promotion. And any sales promotions that help to you know get people to buy that product will only occur in a very short term, um, short sighted sort of way. So how do sales promotions work? I mentioned about this extra incentive, right? And how this incentive is additional beyond the basic benefits that uh, people are buying from the brand. Um, and so psychologically, when you get this extra incentive that goes above and beyond the brand and what you would normally buy it for anyway, what that does is that it temporarily changes the perceived value of the brand. Right? or it changes the perceived price. Now, price and value are obviously related. If you can change the perception of price, then you're changing the perception of value, and vice versa. If you can change the perception of value, make people think it's worth more, then you're justifying their perception of the price. So the example I get here is a very common one. It's a discount sales promotion. So a sales discount is one of the most commonly used forms of sales promotions you will see in the supermarket and online. 50% off, just as a rough example here. When you see 50% off, that automatically changes your perception of the product in several ways. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Now, if you see something's 50% off, you know that it's half as expensive as it used to be. So the value you get there is that, well, I'm getting the same product that I normally would have bought, but now I'm paying you know, half as much for it. Of course, it's more valuable to you in that sense. And of course, you might be more convinced to buy that product. Now, done over the long term, this might change the perception of the value of the brand in a negative way, right? If something is always 50% off, then you start to wonder why you ever paid 100% for it in the first place, right? Because obviously, some of that 50% is probably profit margin, or it's most likely profit margin. And so that changes the, your perception of value in a bad way. And that's why sales promotions have to be careful. Um, well, businesses have to be careful in the way they use sales promotions so as not to dilute their brand. And in subsequent lectures, we'll talk about how some brands can get away with never using sales promotions. Uh, and instead, they trade on brand loyalty. But for the meanwhile, I want you to think about the psychology of how a sales promotion works. Now, it's very easy to convince someone uh, of this change in value or this change in price. Because if I say it's 50% off, then most people will believe that the product is now half as cheap as it used to be, all right? Or half as expensive as it used to be. And so that's very easy to convince you that you should buy this jacket because it's actually 40% discounted um, at, you know, for example, a Katmandu uh, spring sale or something like that, or winter sale or autumn sale. Right? or summer sales, they have sales uh, you know, uh, seasonally. Um, so if you see something is 50% off or 40% off, then you know it's cheaper. I don't need to do three years of brand building and advertising to get you to feel some sort of emotion with my brand, to really aspire to be a, a stereotypical user of my brand. Um, I don't need to convince you it's cool. I don't need to convince you that you're the type of person that the brand is made for. No, I just need to tell you that this is cheaper than it usually is. Uh, therefore, it's more valuable to you because you're in the market for a jacket. You need a new jacket. You normally buy our jackets anyway. But look, here is the same type of jacket that you would normally get, maybe a newer design, but fundamentally the same thing. The only extra value I'm telling you is that it's half as expensive as it used to be, right? That doesn't require too much advertising creativity, um, but it's highly convincing. So it's a lot easier for me to convince you that my product is worth more to you now, or it's cheaper, uh, than to tell you that it's somehow different in an ideological way to my competitors, uh, and that we care for the environment more, really, trust us, or that this celebrity endorser I've paid millions of dollars for really likes my brand above all others. You can see how that, um, that attempt to try and build some sort of unique connection with you uh, is a lot harder work compared to me just telling you at the point of sale or maybe by an advertisement that you know my products are cheaper for this week, you gotta get in, you have to buy the product because normally it's gonna cost you twice as much. Now act, right? So that is a lot easier, right? It's a, it's a lot easier to convince you. And that's why sales promotions work. So why do you as a consumer like sales promotions? Because I've explained how they work psychologically by increasing this value or reducing the cost, but it also helps you in many other ways. So less effort is another way of how sales promotions work at a psychological level. Now, if you're out you know, bargain hunting, 
um, and you see these sales, discounts or promotions, then that essentially makes it less effortful for you to buy my product because I'm giving you a reason already. If, you know, imagine if you're going out and you want to buy some new jeans and you're looking through every single jeans retailer to find that perfect fit, to find the right brand, you know, am I a Wrangler person or am I a Levi's person? Um, do I buy from Just Jeans or do I buy from Glassons or do I buy from, you know, Max or any of these other retailers out there selling essentially a fairly similar product? How am I going to differentiate my pair of jeans um, without, you know, years and years of advertising to try and build the brand up. Well, one really easy way, as I mentioned before, is to just tell you that it, you get something extra for buying these uh, these jeans of mine. It, it could be you get to keep an extra amount of money in your wallet because it's a discounted product, or maybe you buy two of my jeans and you get the third pair free. So you're getting 33% uh, more jeans for your dollar, right? So this, when you see that as a, a sales promotion offer, actually reduces your effort. Because all of a sudden, there's this great deal here. You don't need to look anywhere else because if there are no other equivalent deals, then this is obviously the one you should buy. Because I've basically done the maths for you. I've said, buy this one, it's cheaper. You get an extra pair of jeans if you buy two. Uh, and if you recall back a couple of slides, I said you can use sales promotions to lock in your customers, right? If I sell you three pairs of jeans, you are not going to need jeans for a long time. And so I stopped you from going and developing a habit and perhaps developing, you know, brand loyalty with another brand. Um, so that's another way of how sales promotions work. It reduces the effort that you need in terms of looking for your products or services. It allows people to switch up and people like switching up because it makes them feel uh, good. So instead of buying no frills or budget baked beans, um, you might see, you know, the premium brands such as Watties or Heinz discount sometimes. And, and if the, the discount is positioned just right, then it might encourage people to switch up. So people that would normally buy cheap baked beans think, well, these other premium baked beans are only 50 cents more expensive or a dollar more expensive, um, you know, but they're a lot cheaper than what they used to be. So I'm going to switch up, treat myself, buy this brand that I normally cannot afford, right? And so sales promotions are a really good way for premium brands to encourage, to, to basically expand their market share and take some of the market share away from the budget brands. Um, this interestingly doesn't work quite as well for a budget brand because a budget brand is normally by definition cheaper to begin with. And so if they discount, uh, all they do is cut into their own profit margin because they're already the cheapest brand out there. So you, why would you discount your brand if you're already the cheapest uh, competitor, right? And people are not going to switch down from a premium product they normally can afford to an extra cheap version of the cheap product they normally would not buy anyway, right? So sales promotions work well for premium brands. They want to encourage um, consumers to switch up doesn't work so well for the cheapest brands, the budget brands, because people don't switch down and people that normally buy a budget brand um, will buy it anyway, whether you've discounted and cut into your own profit margin or not. Uh, fourth reason why consumers like sales promotion is because of an ego boost. So you feel good when you've um, scored a bargain. I don't know if it's evolutionary or something, the hunter-gatherer type thing, but if you're looking around for products and you see something that's a really good deal, uh, go back to the example of the jeans, you know, you're looking around for jeans and you, you stumble upon this deal that says buy two, get one free. Well, you feel really good because it's like score. I've just got the jeans I'm looking for anyway, and I've got an extra pair. This is great. And you feel good about yourself and it actually makes the shopping experience uh, that much more exciting and rewarding for the customer. Um, there's the excitement and variety of using new brands. So I mentioned before how sales promotions can be used to switch people from brand to brand. And so um, along with that comes this uh, variety seeking. So I mentioned before how people normally are habitual, particularly in products they're not very involved with, like cereal or, or soup or whatever it might be, or milk. But um, in other products that are maybe a bit more high involvement, like um, fashion or cosmetics or um, uh, you know sne sneakers or sporting goods, um, sometimes a sales promotion is actually the nudge you need to try something new. 
and you get excitement for trying something new because they've given you a sample or they've given you a discount or they've said you know they're, they're running this cool competition uh, and you just need to try the product in, in order to enter it you know that sort of excitement that sales promotion is really good at introducing into a market uh, is another reason why you as consumers really like sales promotions you know not only are they normally better value for you as a consumer but it also helps to make the marketplace seem more competitive and more exciting uh, than it would be otherwise without these sales promotions um, and sometimes the promotion itself is entertaining so you know competitions are a great example of sales promotions that help liven up a mature uh, sector uh, something that's a bit stodgy has not really changed in years all of a sudden they've got a great new competition so that's going to be entertaining the promotion itself is entertaining Sometimes you also get sales promotions uh, that are quite entertaining to participate in. So a classic example are the competitions that, you know, the supermarkets launch in terms of like you buy, spend a certain amount of money with us and you get some stickers or some cards, some trading cards or maybe tokens to go towards um, some Tupperware or some a knife set uh, or some cooking pots, you know, so or cutlery so that in itself is a sales promotion because it's a you know an additional incentive you're giving people um, that would normally shop at your supermarket anyway but it's also quite entertaining and it will help lock people in because they start collecting the stickers that go towards the knife set or the cutlery uh, and they're locked to your supermarket chain um, but they also find that an entertaining experience, you know, ooh, how much have I spent? Do I get this extra sticker now? Oh, if I only spent another $10, I wouldn't have another sticker and I'd be closer to getting, uh, you know, the steak knife or something. And so people do get into that uh, and it helps to make, once again, the, the, it makes the shopping experience more valuable above and beyond what they would normally be doing anyway. So looking at sales promotion versus advertising, I mentioned before how sales promotion is a very short term uh, looking at influencing the action so that you get some immediate return on investment, usually by encouraging the customer that there's an immediate value to them, an extra incentive. We contrast that with um, advertising, which is longer term. It takes anywhere from three to five years to build a brand up from scratch, right? So a brand that no one's ever heard of, you're going to be advertising, uh, you know, informing people, persuading them, reminding them of your brand, um, all these sorts of things to try and convince them that your brand is worthy of their business. So it's a very long-term uh, initiative and you're trying to influence their attitude at that point. You don't necessarily get them to convince them to buy your product the first time they see your ad or even the third time they've seen your ad. But what you are doing is that you're influencing their attitude and commitment towards your brand. So Coca-Cola is a great example of, you know, decades and decades of worth of advertising. They've really built that brand up so that you, so not only is the brand top of mind when you think of Colas, but you also know vaguely what the brand stands for, the imagery, the symbolism that is associated with that brand, the type of people that typically use that brand, the type of situations that brand is suitable for, all these sorts of things have been built up through decades of advertising. You contrast that with sales promotions, it's basically, you know, you don't have to do any advertising, you just need to tell people that the product is cheaper at the point of sale or give them something extra. And that's what you're, that's the level of operation that sales promotions um, work at. Um, so on one hand, you've got advertising that, you know, tries to increase the long-term uh, value of the brand to the consumer, build that relationship, get that brand commitment. And on the other hand, you've got sales promotions that basically nudge them in the right direction at the last possible second so that they buy your brand versus a compete, competing brand. So the growth in sales promotions, we talked about why, you know, why they work from a psychological level, why consumers love them, why all the great things they can do for businesses. So those are all the reasons. Now here are some more reasons why there is a growth in sales promotions. So first off is the balance of power that has shifted from manufacturers to retailers. Back in the old days, and we're talking like industrial revolution types uh, or turn of the century in uh, 1900s, um, there weren't that many ma manufacturers around, right? So when they made the products, there was already a market for them. People were dying to buy stuff. Now, hop forward to this day and age where there's way too many manufacturers all making pretty much the same thing. And so the competition is crazy. And so not everyone wants to buy a product just because you're making it anymore. In fact, you have to convince people to buy a product. And more importantly, you have to convince retailers to stock your product because that is the bottleneck where people go to buy products. 
And so with this power shift to the retailer, all of a sudden manufacturers have to compete even more to try to convince the retailer to stock their products. And sales promotions are a really good way for all the reasons I've mentioned beforehand why manufacturers use them because they're trying to convince not only consumers to pull the product through the supply chain but also retailers to sell it in the first place. And so you know, uh, a former colleague of mine uh, used to um, design uh, point of sale uh, containers for Wrigley's, the, the chewing gum company. And he always said, you know, you would think that we come up with some great flavors, um, the retailers, you know, would be happy to have these new flavors, you know, watermelon and mint or whatever it might be, kiwi fruit and coriander, whatever it might be. Well, the truth is the retailers don't like new flavors because new flavors means that they have to now split the existing shelf space into even smaller increments to fit your new flavors in. So retailers actually say, we don't want new flavors. Just give us the stuff that we know works and we keep selling the banana flavor because we know that people buy the banana flavor of juicy fruit. Right. Whereas as the manufacturer, as Wrigley's, you want to be creating new products because you know that people get bored of your old products and they might go to a different company. And so you're trying to convince the retailer to stop the new coriander and you know, kiwi fruit flavor. And the retailers will say, well, no, why should we stop this new product that has no track record? We don't know if it's going to sell. You might just be taking up some sh shelf space. Why don't we just keep the old stuff we know works? And so this is when the manufacturer goes, okay, well, hang on a second then. Look, I've designed this point of sale promotional toolbox and it, it, it basically sells the amount, the same amount of stuff. It just uses the space more uh, efficiently. It's more eye catching. So people are going to see it. They're going to engage with it. And look, we'll also um, set up some sampling around the corner to get people to try the sample free of charge. You don't have to pay for it. We set this up. We give out vouchers and if they like the product, then they can buy it at this at this um, point of sale container. So you can see how the manufacturer has to negotiate the right to exist within the retail space. And sales promotions are a really good tool to help encourage the retailers to accept the new product. Um, there's increased brand proliferation and competition and clutter. So this relates to the first point about how there's more manufacturers making similar products now that really, you know, not everyone needs. And so this increased competition means that people are not only buying products for the product attributes, but they're looking for extra reasons, these extra incentives to want to buy a particular product over another. And because of this, people are now price sensitive. There's constant discounting that happens. And so people now often buy only when things are discounted, right? So this is where we start getting to that slippery slope of how sales promotions work, but sometimes they work too well. They become a victim of their own success because sales promotions work. People use them, businesses use them. And because businesses use them and consumers respond to them, consumers are trained to only respond to sales promotions from now on. And people are price sensitive. You know, I want you to think about when was the last time you bought a product that wasn't discounted. Uh, or on sale or had some sort of sales promotion element added to it, right? It's quite, I mean, speaking for myself, I rarely buy something like if I was going to buy jackets or jeans or, or clothes, I rarely buy them at full price because I know at some point I'm going to be able to get the same thing or something very similar for at least 20% less. And so why would I buy pay 100% when I know that I just need to wait uh, a month or so uh, and just get the product uh, when it's on discount. So I've been trained uh, to, to behave that way and I'm sure many of you are the same. And with this comes reduced brand loyalty. You know, back in the old days, especially, you know, a long time ago when there weren't that many manufacturers, there were only a few brands. And so you bought your favorite brand and that was like your favorite brand and you only ever bought that favorite brand and they never had to discount it because you were loyal. But now if you look at your generation, um, you're probably not that loyal to any particular brand unless that brand has been able to lock you into their ecosystem somehow. But usually, particularly in fast moving consumer goods or FMCGs, um, you're not that brand loyal and you go basically from sales promotion to sales promotion, buying the cheapest product at any given moment when you need that product or buying the product that gives you the best extra incentive. Um, so that's the reason for growth in sales promotions. There's also the splintering of mass market and reduced media effectiveness. So this links back to advertising. In order to advertise, you need media that reaches a lot of people. Um, and because no one medium will reach a lot of people anymore, you have to do all these different things. You can't just advertise on you know, Coronation Street or the news to get everyone anymore. 
like you could, you know, a few decades ago. Now people are streaming their own, uh, you know, content on Netflix or on uh, YouTube or on Amazon or on um, Disney. So they're watching things through different media outlets. Um, there's also social media that they're paying attention to. Uh, there might be the radio that they listen to, but there could be podcasts as well. So it's really hard to get your message out there across all these different um, splintered media to try and reach the audience you want. So what that means is that if you can't reach everyone that you think you need to reach because everyone's so splintered um, and media is not that effective anymore, well, what can you bank on? You can bank on that they still have to go somewhere to buy your product or the comp comp competitor's products at some point. And so this is the point of retail or that supermarket or the shopping mall, or they have to get uh, on the road and and, and see something on a billboard before they get to the place they're going to buy a product. And so sales promotions can cut through the clutter and just say something, such as, for example, on a billboard that says, you know, um, Briscoe's um, spring sale, 25% off everything, right? So now instead of having to try and find people through all these different types of media they're paying attention to, I just have to think, well, where is my store? It's over here in St. Luke's. People have to go on this motorway to get there. Uh, and they have to go on this other motorway to get there. I just need two billboards that tell everyone that I've got an extra incentive to buy shop at Briscoe's in the next month because I'm having a seasonal sale. Uh, and if I do those two um, billboards correctly, then they should just come to the store, right? Uh, there's no point in reaching someone uh, online through their Facebook feed if I don't even know if they're you know, within driving distance to my store or not, right? And so there's all this complicated targeting that needs to occur on media, um, sometimes it's just too difficult. And businesses just use sales promotions because they know that they work and they know this extra incentive will get people to buy the product. And if they do it right, they can intercept people and capitalize on all the other advertising that other brands have done. Uh, because at the end of the day, people still need to buy their product somewhere. Whether it's online, if you're on Amazon or on eBay or whatever it might be, you still have to be at that point of sale right to add it to your cart uh, and at that point other brands will have their sales promotions you know right there you know people that have bought this product have also considered buying this product would you like to buy this product for 20 percent less right so that happens in a digital environment but it also happens in a physical environment you go to the supermarket or the shopping mall and you see um, a sale on an e-sign or at the on the shelf that says basically you know consider this product because it is now cheaper or buy this product because you get this extra bonus pack. So the splintering of the mass market and reduced media effectiveness means that sales promotions has become a very good way of cutting through that clutter. Um, it's short term orientation and it's account uh, it's got high accountability. So you think, well, that, you know, why would that result in a growth in sales promotion? They don't sound uh, short term orientation doesn't sound too good. Well, the reality is that the financial year is a short term uh, perspective. It's one year. I mentioned before how it takes many years to build commitment to a brand, um, but really the financial year goes every 12 months, right? March, April, March, April. And so with the short term orientation comes accountability that is also targeted at short term in initiatives. And sales promotion is very accountable in a very short term fashion. So it works really well to fit into the financial system that business operate in. Right. We can say how much the sales promotion costs, whether it be a competition or a sampling uh, campaign or a discount. Um, we know how much that costs and we can also track the, the, the upswing in sales when that sales promotion was launched. Right. Because sales promotions are immediate, when you discount something, you see the results immediately within the, that range of when the discount is active. And so it's highly accountable and it's contained and you know how much it costs. So you can see how it becomes very accountable and very easy to justify uh, to the financial um, people within a business or organization. And so that's another reason why there is a growth in sales promotions because it's very easy to justify and defend. Whereas advertising, you know, you could spend millions of dollars doing some brand building campaign that tries to evoke an emotional response. You know how much it costs, but how do you know what that ad campaign brought in in terms of return on investment. And so that's very difficult to justify compared to a sales promotion. And finally, consumer responsiveness. So you guys are the reasons why there has been a growth in sales promotions. It works, 
you know because you've bought that stuff on discount before or you've responded to sales promotions before and because you respond it's very likely that other people like you have responded and because it works that's why there's a self-fulfilling prophecy there and businesses um, have to continue to do sales promotions uh, because of all the reasons basically that we've covered